you know, and, and Donald Trump has told us exactly what he will do. He will not abide by the rulings of the courts. Uh, he uh, will certainly appoint people to office, whether or not they can be confirmed by the Senate. If you look at, for example, the Republicans who are in control of Congress today, um, they are, are collaborating with Donald Trump. Uh, you cannot count on a House of Representatives led by somebody like Mike Johnson to stop this president. You can't count on a Senate of Josh Hawley's and Mike Lee's to stop Donald Trump. Oh, real quickly, you have not ruled out running for president yourself. Do you envision something where you run with the Democrat and do some kind of unity ticket? I'm going to decide over the course of the next couple of months, uh, and it will certainly depend upon where it looks like things are going with the nominations of, of both parties. But again, I think it, it is a, it's a moment where people have to be willing to put partisanship aside and say the future of the country demands that we, we uh, save the republic, and we're never going to get the chance to debate all the other really important issues if we allow Donald Trump the power to unravel the very foundations of our, of our Constitution. Well, there you have it. Hey, folks, welcome to Ballot Box. I'm Tim Miller. I'm here with Bill Crystal. Uh, though we might be changing the name of the show to the Liz Cheney Power Hour. Or all thing, all Liz, all the time. I don't know. We've got we have a lot of Liz Cheney to discuss and Liz Cheney Kremlinology. I did. I was just kind of I was kind of a little bit off guard though because Savannah Guthrie's look there. I just love everything that Savannah's doing right now. I need to let her know. Um, Bill, how are you? Are you ready to do some Liz Cheney Kremlinology? <laughs> sure. How, how are you? First of all, everything okay there? And I'm doing wonderful here in New, New Orleans, Orleans. Things are great. Um, yeah, I just had Liz a Cheney talk on the streets of New Orleans. They're just buzzing about Liz. Could she do it? Third party? Yes. No. Attacks on Trump. Dictatorship? Yes. No. I was just at Liza's by the track having their barbecue shrimp po' boy, and there was no discussion of Liz Cheney there. But that, but you know, uh, maybe I just don't seem that approachable. Uh, if you have questions for us, things you want us to talk about, I'm I'm peeking at the comments right now, so I'll take an eye on them. But my big question for Bill is. Are you at all alarmed about Liz Cheney's answer about the third party? Um, you know, we've been hearing a lot from Liz this week. There's been a lot of stuff on our all of our bulwark-related platforms, uh, all of her reveals about Mike Johnson and her legitimate fears about Trump. But do we have any concern about Liz Cheney's third party uh, flirtations? Not much. I mean, she in the answer, I believe she said, uh, look, we need to, to I'll, I'll, everything I do will be governed by the necessity to defeat Donald Trump. Now, does that mean she'll toy with the third party thing and the one in a hundred chance that there's a chance that she could win? Is there, will she keep it open as a possibility to allow, to get more attention, frankly, for her, you know, campaign against Trump. And then at the end of the day, whether that's in March or April or in conceivably the summer or something, say, no, look, I support the Democratic nominee. I think that's by far the most likely outcome. Maybe there's a little price to be paid for the toying. I can take that point, too, that, you know, it distracts people from just rallying behind Biden. But I think there's plenty of time to rally behind Biden. She does speak to some people who, if she just said, I'm for Joe Biden, period, end of story. I think there's some people who wouldn't be listening to her who might be listening to her now. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that there were a couple of other reveals, um, you know, over the course of the interview tour she's been on. Um, I, she was adamant today with Nicole Wallace, for example. Congrats, Nicole, on the new baby, by the way. Uh, she was adamant today on Nicole Wallace that uh, her number one priority was stopping Trump. Uh, much, obviously, this almost goes without saying, but much more passionate and clear-eyed and uh, just... At, uh, absolutely un he will be unbowed about that than what you hear from the no labels people who kind of say that sometimes they play lip service occasionally they'll toss out a little lip service we don't want to help trump we don't want to help trump like that it literally is not doing lip service I and mean, she was abundantly clear that she will not do anything that helps trump she wants to do anything that maximizes the ability to stop trump i think that's one her comments about the republican house and how she's kind of like rooting for them to lose, I think are also very revealing, right? It's not the kind of thing that you would say um, if you were planning on running a spoiler campaign. Uh, and so I, I think that she's really unbelievably clear-eyed about the threat. I think like you're saying, I think that there is, you know, kind of a, we are in unprecedented times. We've got an 81-year-old nominee on one side and the other nominee that might be convicted in federal court, right? So it's kind of like, you know, I, I, to rule anything out about what might things look like next Memorial Day, you know, in a Sherman-esque fashion, maybe doesn't make sense. Um, but man, Liz has been so good that I think it's it's hard to believe that anybody should have any spoiler fears. No, I really I think that's very well said and argued. And also, I just one other point. What you would say if you were actually, what the no-labels people tend to say are the people who are considering 
running on the no labels to get the Larry Hogan's of the world and stuff say is, you know, two thirds or three quarters of the American people don't want a Biden Trump matchup. <clears throat> we can do better than Biden and Trump. And they loop, they make, they create a certain kind of, let's say, moral equivalence uh, between Biden and Trump. And, and they're, they're the alternative to both of them. It's very, Liz could easily do that. And it's interesting that she doesn't, right? She doesn't right. say, I got big problems with both of them, frankly, Savannah. And, you know, I want to keep the option open. She says, look, it's early. I'm going to take a look for the next couple of months, but we need to be Trump. So that's that's very different. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's not even a label suit. I was, uh, I saw a clip from Squawk Box this morning of Joe, whatever his name is, Joe Squawk Box and our old friend Arthur Brooks. And they're like talking about how like that that Donald Trump is a narcissist and, and, <clears throat> and he's ruined our politics. But maybe the other guy is also a narcissist. And frankly, they kind of are just narcissists in different ways. And Arthur Brooks like, well, yeah, that's a good point, Joe. I'm like, what are you guys talking? So I, I, it just this this false equivalency stuff trickles down everywhere around people in the Liz orbit. I, that is a relevant example because the people that Liz is going to be trying to speak to and convince are CNBC Squawk Box viewers, right? It's not it's not the campus kids and whether or not they turn out and it's not, you know, uh, Democratic voters that uh, and, and uh, it is these Republican Wall Street Journal types. And so Liz needs to be able to speak to them. She's doing it in a clear way. One other thing about her, just really quick before we move on. What she did in 2022 is noteworthy. You know, everybody's like, she did what we've been begging everybody to do, right? Everybody says it's fantasy politics. Oh, why can't, you know, the Republican that sees the difference just endorse the Democrat, right? Like, why can't they just endorse the Democrat on a couple of times and say, hey, it's not forever. It's not. She did that in a couple of these Secretary of State's races in the Mastriano race, I believe, too. And so, you know, and we got a track record here, I guess, is the other thing. And also, just one, one more point on this, but since it's Jose, why, why shouldn't we just do Liz all, all, Liz all the time? It's just the most interesting person out there right now, uh, certainly. I mean, she could, on a book tour, easily be, and let me tell another story about what a jerk Kevin McCarthy is, and here's what Jim Jordan said to me, and she's got that in the book, and, um, and she's talked about it at times, and it's gotten some of the very initial coverage was on that. She's pretty disciplined in turning to 2024, not to dwelling on 2021 and 2022, Interesting is admirable as what she did in those two years was, and interesting as the stories are. And she is really on the, he wants to be a dictator. We need to take him seriously at his word. Here are some examples of what he might do in defense and on judges, you know, with, with, with the courts and so forth, uh, or the Justice Department. And um, she's been very, I mean, that, that I think also is very, is revealing, right? It's pretty you you're you thought you did an equally big book tour a few months ago it's uh, was it a year ago now as liz it's uh, and that's what people are saying it's the t liz cheney's book tour is the tim miller book tour savannah didn't have me on by the way and yeah. i don't think i don't remember that uh savannah yeah, that was, that's, uh, that's, that's we I, I i can pull you up had the text. Bigger, you had bigger fish to fry undoubtedly but you know how easy it is to lapse into your book one's book talking points and i don't blame people sure. it's a good book and why shouldn't she talk yeah. about that stuff but she's really been disciplined and saying no my message is about 2024 it's not about oh the committee was really good and it was unfair right. that the republicans attacked the committee and all this kind of stuff so, right yeah. or all these like you know it feels like everybody in washington has you know recriminations and like they all feel like they've been treated unfairly right like that's the i mean frankly the worst what like, you're talking about is the better the worst version which was what we hear from most of these people would be uh right. i was stabbed in the back and, you know, I should have been the conference chair and I, you know, like all, all of that kind of stuff. I mean, um, you know, the media was too mean to me. Fox News was too mean to me anyway. Um, OK, well, I've got good news. I've already taped two other things about Liz Cheney uh, that are coming to the Bulwark YouTube page. So if you if you need any more analysis of what's happening in the Liz Cheney book, you just keep coming back to uh, our YouTube page and subscribe right there. Um, I, Bill, I'm mostly um, as fascinated as I am by your uh, Liz Cheney uh uh, you know, kind of putting her on the couch. Um, I like the Ukraine. I, I feel like you, I'm, I'm interested in your view on what's happening with the Ukraine and immigration debate right now on the Hill. And just to kind of set the table for people that haven't been following it as closely, you know, essentially uh, we have another funding round coming up um, uh, that would include Ukraine and Israel. Um, and the Republicans have said that there will be no money for Ukraine without some pretty dr draconian changes to border policy. It's not kind of like, oh, you got to do a, you got to give us a couple million for the wall and then we'll give you money for Ukraine and we'll cut a deal. It's not that. It's like you got to change um, a, a lot of the policies with how we deal with asylees, how we deal with people coming to the border and money for the border. And, and like whatever you think about these policies, it's, it's very much outside of the budgeting scope, right? 
And um, and Republicans have said they're not negotiating on this and, and they would be happy to basically shut down Ukraine funding. And Joe Perticone in his press pass newsletter for the Bulwark, which is awesome about keeping up to speed on what Republicans are thinking on the Hill. Um, you know, he said basically that the Democrats and, and uh, the Biden administration, I guess, was going to have a private briefing, you know, about the state of the war for for members. And that there was no expectation that that was going to change anybody's point of view. So, I, I mean, that is pretty shocking to me. And it's even more shocking that kind of like even the Lindsey Grahams, even the Mitt Romneys of the world kind of seem to be on board with this gamesmanship. So w- what say you about the state of play? No, I think it's terrible. I mean, I, I talked with some Democrat on the Hill about 10 days ago. He was like, OK, we're going to get in this negotiation. It's going to be pain for our people. We're going to have to give up some stuff they don't like on the negotiations on border security symbolic stuff and actually some real policy changes but we'll work it out i think and we can get 70 votes and blah, 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 get it to the house and then figure out how to pressure speaker johnson to bring it to the floor etc and but the republican position is not let's have a negotiation about the border or about spending on the border or even about some of the policies on the border it's we want our border policies and that's the price right. you have to pay for ukraine and they're treating it as if they were against Ukraine and against Israel, for that matter. And therefore, they need to be given a price to go along with something. Whereas I kind of thought that some number of them actually believed in the cause of helping Ukraine and thought that was kind of important. And maybe they can't get all their border stuff, maybe not even most of it. And maybe they shouldn't even approach it this way in terms of getting a price for something they're supposed to be for helping Ukraine and Israel. So I'm but I've always this confirms, I got to say, you and I discussed this maybe two weeks ago. I mean, I've always been more pessimistic than a lot of people that, oh, the Republicans will eventually go along and Mitch McConnell will get the 20 Republican senators and they'll end run Johnson in the House. And I've always been worried this thing uh, that, you know, you got a party that that's very, very likely to nominate Trump. And one of Trump's highest priorities is not helping Ukraine. And um, one of Maggot's highest priorities is not helping Ukraine. And I'm, I'm, it's, but it really would be very, I, mean, I think, disastrous. It's a policy matter, and I, I hope the Democrats can raise and Biden can raise enough of an alarm about this. But they they do shame the Romneys of the world into saying no, this is too much, and let's you know let's fight our fights on the border and all this. We got to help Ukraine and Israel. But again, it does kind of get to the other point about the Romneys of the world, if I can say, which is for all that they've he's been admirable in, in, in many respects, and others have been pretty good, and seven of them voted for impeachment in 2021 in the Senate. But at the end of the day. You know, the idea that they're going to go up with Lindsey Graham is now on board with this. We have to help ourselves before we can help Ukraine. Well, which maybe he's right that we should be doing certain things that we're not doing for ourselves. But we also need to do the right things for Ukraine, right? Yeah, that's like a J.D. Vance talking point. It's crazy. I I mean, honestly, if I I don't even know what to tell the Democrats. I'm not not that they're asking me, but maybe the Democrats just have to say we're dealing with a totally irresponsible party here. We do need to help Ukraine, though, in Israel. So we're just going to have to swallow hard and adopt policies we don't like for a year until we win the election, I guess. But I don't know. It's I, I, I can see why the Democrats are sort of saying, really, is this how it's supposed to work? You know? Yeah, I want to get into the brass tax on the Democrats thing. Uh, but I, I just just put a finer point on this one more time. I want to read what Romney put out on this. Dems want $106 billion for Ukraine. GOP wants a closed border. That's the trade. But clueless Dems want to negotiate the border bill. Not going to happen. Is an open border more important to Dems than Ukraine and Israel? I mean, that is a really harsh assessment of the situation. You know, way harsh tie, as I would say. I, I and and again, to your point, it shows that it's like that 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 Romney is basically admitting in this construct that it's like the Democrats want to do Ukraine and Israel, and like Republicans don't really, and so the Democrats have to deal with them in order to fund this. I, I mean, it would be like a a counterfactual situation like during the end of the Afghanistan war, right? Where Democrats were like, we need Medicare for all, right? And in order to keep funding Afghanistan. And and then, you know, a Democratic senator is like, does, you know, do the do the Republicans like is is not giving people health care more important to the Republicans than funding our troops? I, you know, it's kind of a preposterous negotiating uh, like ploy, isn't it? I mean, it's not really uh, in the standard fare of how we've negotiated these sorts of, you know, funding bills in the past. No, and the Democrats control the executive branch and one of two branches of the legislature. So it's not as if the Democrats are trying to ram this through. They they, they don't control anything and they're sort of imposing right. this, you know, through narrow control of one house. It's the opposite. The Republicans who have very narrow control of one house 
have the ability to block things in the Senate because you need 60 votes, are basically trying to impose 100% of Democrat, of Republican border policy on the Democrats as a price of getting something that the Republicans claim to be in favor of, which is helping support Ukraine and Israel. Um, so, okay. We have, we have level set here. Both of us think that what the Republicans are doing is crazy, that the Democrats are the only responsible governing party in this situation. And that it's, I, it's really almost, it's not surprising that the Republicans are doing this, but that even the Grahams and Cottons and Romneys of the world who ostensibly are for Ukraine and are like, are for this, uh, you know, really, um, ag extremely aggressive negotiation tactic and, and putting Ukraine on the chopping block over it. But let's say they hold the line until next year. I, I mean, is it, do the Democrats feel like maybe, I, I don't, I mean, the Democrats couldn't get the house, house people in the vote to vote for it. And I don't, how does Schumer bring it up? Practically speaking, it's just hard to think about how you get around a situation where Chuck Schumer brings up a Donald Trump immigration policy and says, I'm going to put the Donald Trump immigration policy, border policy back in place. Um, it's kind of hard to see that happening, but you know, is there a Machiavellian argument that they should do that in order to neutralize that argument? Yes, yes, I think there is. Uh, I've heard that from a few people, a few people who are sympathetic to the Biden administration. Look, this doing us a favor. They sort of take it. We took your border policy for the next year, takes it off the, takes a real Biden weakness off the table. And there's even a principled argument for doing it, which is maybe at the end of the day, it's more important for Ukraine to win than exactly what our asylum policies are. I don't to minimize the the differences sure. they're pretty complicated and exactly what our asylum or refugee policies are or other policies at the border for the next for the next year i mean that's you know maybe that's true maybe that is, so it's not just a machiavellian argument this kind of a depends how you weigh these different the importance uh, of these different policies feels like the clintonian thing to do i don't know and when i was thinking this in my head i was like tim is this your old republican turning out but i don't know maybe it's the bill clinton uh move for for joe biden here at the end i don't i, I think that this is going to um you know be something that we're going to really be talking about probably every tuesday uh for a little while now because i don't think that there's any resolution coming soon okay just one more thing though on your uh you have conversations with folks in europe and stuff like what is do, do you have any sense for just you know, how, how immediate the threat is for Ukraine, right? Like I, I they've received a lot of weapons before, you know, and is there, is, is this, is this urgent? I, I do, do you have any sense? Obviously they would never say it's not urgent, but like what's yeah. your sense in having conversations? A little hard to tell. I mean, if there's really no money at all for a year, that's terrible. Is it urgent in the sense that the next three weeks matter compared to the next month or that the exact levels matter quite as much? The war is kind of deadlocked for, you know, unfortunately, and so in a way, I don't think they'll collapse if, they, if this doesn't happen before, you know, before the new year. Okay. Um, I want to talk about uh, Republicans house retirements with you a little bit. Um, I, I think it's somewhat related to this. Uh, the Republicans can stop things, but they can't really pass anything for themselves. They couldn't before. And now they've lost Santos. Uh, they have another retire uh, somebody that's retiring. Uh, McCarthy looks like he's maybe heading for the exits early. And now we had an announcement today, Patrick McHenry, he's going to serve out his term, um, but he's retiring. So I'm interested in your thoughts. One on, on McHenry, who I saw from your X feed that maybe you've, you've talked to recently and, and two, just on like the implications of the house going from whatever, a five seat majority down to three, two. I mean, the latter would still depend on a few Republicans being willing to say to, uh speaker johnson look we're not voting for this that's happened a little bit but also we'll support a democratic discharge petition on something important and so far there's been no very little courage there as there's been not much courage on the senate side doing anything serious and they did some bipartisan deals but in really standing up uh to this year in 2023 four to the maga base uh pat McHenry. um so i was on the sala to going to new york i guess it was tuesday as you are car. A cell man, a, a quiet car, a cell man, as you yeah, are. I, I never you know, you're among your people, as you, Jack Lou. Now, now I'm yeah, exactly now I'm on, now for some reason I decided I'm getting old. I guess the quiet car is okay. So I was peacefully on the quiet car. And of course, when you're on the quiet car, you don't have the normal overhearing some voice that you recognize because no one's talking. So we literally got up at the end and pulled the Penn Station. And two seats behind me is Pat McHenry, and we recognize each other. We knew each other back in the day a little bit. Um, and we said hello, and we obviously both made the decision to be, you know, 
DC cordial, even though we've been, you know, battling quite hard. And and he is a more decent one, and he voted to certify and stuff. So I didn't have the kind of crisis I would have had if I felt if it had been Elise Stefanik or or you know someone of that or Jim Jordan, obviously. So you know, how are you? Fine. And I, I guess I said, hey, I'm sorry you're not speaker. I would have preferred you to Mike Johnson. And he sort of he he had a fake, you know, kind of oh no, it's worked out great, you know. <laughs> so and then I said, well, look, could you? Really, and actually, it's funny. You, I said, I did, don't you do this kind of thing like in private conversation? You know, I said, can you? Are you guys going to deliver the Ukraine aid? It's really important, and he's been good on that. So, it was, yeah. you know, once you get open, and he's, yeah, I think we'll work it out, Bill, and stuff. But mostly, I was struck at how relaxed and pleasant he seemed, and not without the burdens of the world on him. It was a Tuesday morning going to New York. You, I think they usually come in by right, Tuesday afternoons. They usually go the other way on the Acela at that point, you know, and um, and I didn't really occur to me like why is he sort of just taking the Acela. He seemed to be sort of by himself, you know, uh, and maybe he was going up. J.P. Morgan Chase, you know. Exactly, know, right. Uh, and that's, that's why he felt like a, a relaxed guy who could afford to be maybe seen even being friendly to me. And he wasn't going to be attacked by Steve Bannon yeah. one hour later or something. So maybe it all it all comes together. See him anyway. lobbying his ex-colleagues to keep the carried interest tax from going up uh, any day now. Um, yeah, we have a comment about a little angry leprechaun. I, I, I don't know that I quite um share your uh co your kind analysis of Pat McHenry's behavior I guess he has been better than Elise Stefanik that is true um it is though you know to my big takeaway which um uh, is that I, I we are on this inexorable path to the entire Republican house being insane and I just I don't think that that has sunk in with a, a certain group of people yet. I think that maybe a lot of our, our watchers probably that has sunk in with. But um, that, you know, every time one of these things comes up, you know, they're like, oh, we can rely on the McHenry's of the world to do that, you know, to do what you're talking about, to get the Ukraine thing through or we can rely on so and so like there are there's not going to be people to rely on pretty soon. Right. And um, and and the there's a lot of self-selection both from members that are sitting members not running and something you and I have talked about before from potential Republicans, the types of people that would be normal and they got in there deciding not to run because they don't want to deal with it. And I think Trump's like Trump running this cycle has exacerbated that in a great, in a big way. In a big way. I mean, look, the one person who really sees this clearly, as you said earlier, is Liz Cheney, and she's gone out of her way to address the Republican House issue. It was a little bit, you know, she kind of wanted to bring it up. Maybe she was asked about Johnson, but still, you know, how unacceptable it would be to have a Republican House. Partly, she, they, because of the, you know, overturning the election problem in January 2025, but partly just because they are so much, uh, so enslaved, as it were, to, uh, to, 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 to Trump. Um, but I think more generally, don't you think, and this gets into a little more trouble before, people have not internalized what it means to have Trump as the very, very likely nominee and a party that is entirely on board with that, with very few dissidents. A couple of people who say they won't vote for him, Romney, uh, in, in November. But as we discussed, Chris Sununu last week, a lot who were, a, quote, against Trump and prefer Nikki Haley and will endorse Nikki Haley. But are all going to be there for him, including Nikki Haley, apparently. I haven't seen any reversal on that. Christie, maybe not. So one, one guy won't. Uh, but very few, really. I, uh, and, and the degree to which the party is therefore going along with this radical, let's just call it dictatorial agenda, as Bob Kagan has called it, and Liz Cheney has called it, is really striking. And people have not internalized that either, out, either in the commentariat, I would say, uh, even Democrats, actually or Republicans out there in the country who are still in some fantasy. I mean, one thing, so Bill Barr and all these people don't want Trump to be president, they say. They certainly don't want Trump to be the Republican nominee. What, when could they do something that would make a difference to stop Donald Trump, maybe, possibly, let's just say, from being the Republican nominee? In the next six weeks, wouldn't you say, in Iowa or New Hampshire? Being, I mean, oh, the nominee? I, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it's over if Trump wins Iowa and New Hampshire. So if you yeah. are serious about whether you're Tim Scott or Bill Barr or Mike Pence or Mitch McConnell, who knows if anyone in Iowa and New Hampshire listen to any of these people, I take that point. But still, they're not nobody. And if they showed up at the Des Moines, you know, economic club and did some stuff and stuff, it would affect some normie Republicans on the fence there. Yes. Maybe, I, maybe Trump's a bit too far. I should go to Nikki. None of them is, so far as I can tell, none of them is doing anything. They're all like, I'm, I, I wish her. I'm not really for Trump. I think it should be someone else. I'm very curious. I mean, like, is the Wall Street Journal editorial page, the National Review, are they going to 
really spend a month pounding Trump and promoting Nikki, they could affect some of the business Republicans in, in Iowa. Senators could attract, affect the farm-oriented Republicans. Anyway, I'm just saying that it's really striking to me that no one even, they don't even think about it. It's not, I was talking to Bob Kagan about this actually. I mean, sort of, it's not, he said, why aren't they doing that? And and it was, I, I don't even, they're not even like, they're not rejecting doing it because it's not, they're not even, it doesn't even occur to them that that's their responsibility to do it. And yeah, then well, they're going to be lamenting a bit in February and March and April, and then they'll be supporting Trump by May, June. Yeah, well, they've already decided that it makes no difference. What What's the point? Why risk it? Why put myself out there? This is it's cautionary. It's cowardly. And it's like this is all, all we've done every single time. And it's like anybody that stuck their neck out has gotten it chopped off like Liz. But it's like, well, nobody's ever put in a concerted effort. Right. right? So so how do you know it didn't work? Um, and, you know, this was the whole thing that always drove me crazy when we would criticize DeSantis and they'd be like, the bulwark people really want to have Trump around. And I'm like, no, I do not want to have Trump around. I just, I also thought I happened to think Ron DeSantis was fascist curious, but please, but like it would have been fine. And and we have all put our names out there on the line and have been in multiple PACs organizations, ran ads with millions of dollars, like change our, like we've all put our names on the line, been like anybody but this fucking guy. And like, these guys do nothing anyway. And these guys, many of them are, 72 years old at the end of their careers they had their job right. in the Trump administration they don't they're not like risking the next 20 years of their right. career as Liz Cheney college fact, they're know. not paying college you right. know Liz Cheney's got a lot of college payments up to coming okay anyway this takes us to we're running out of time this is about as much time as the, the last debate is worth um because this is a direct transition to what I want to ask you about tomorrow's debate which is why should I watch it uh, if if the NBA in season tournament was on tomorrow, I would definitely not be watching it. But it happens to be on right now. I've got it on DVR. Um, and um, at, at, like, I, still though, I don't see a point. If these people aren't going to take it seriously, why should I take it seriously? And again, this is going to the same thing about Bill Barr. It's like if. In any other situation, if you are running behind somebody by forty-five points and you have the stage to yourself, you would use that opportunity to try to dislodge the person that is beating you by 45 points. These people have had three opportunities. They've not done it. I don't understand why I would watch this. I mean, you'd only watch to see if Nikki Haley does decide to do it this time. But I was talking with someone who's talked to her people, you know, sort of a decent Republican who's in touch with some of the less decent Republicans, and but still more decent than Trump. And uh, his view was, look, they think they're on the right path. They think it's suicide to go in a Chris Christie, Liz Shandy direction. And so they're just going to kind of keep doing a kind of clever sort of Trump adjacent. But yeah, we can't use the chaos as bad. You know, we need to make sure we can win. And nothing's about Trump is unacceptable as president. I mean, and if Nick Haley, but if Nick Haley doesn't say that, that would be revealing, I suppose. This could be the last debate, I, I guess. This supposed to, is there one in, in Iowa? There usually has been, but. I don't know if there will be or not. So um, I do have a suggestion from Mead Solomon for me to just get high tomorrow instead of watching the debate. That's an interesting suggestion. Um, uh, I, how could they? They couldn't really think that they're on the right path, could they? I mean, it's hard for me. To, I talked to a couple of Nikki people, but they're not going to tell me the truth. But like, they can't possibly think that they're on the right path. I mean, she's getting slaughtered. Like, I, I, yeah, sure, she's on the right path to eke out a second place against DeSantis. Is that what her I think goal is? They only path that they can be on and so here's the more cynical question someone asked me this today and i really don't know the answer do they are they kidding themselves do they just are they sort of fatalistic and there's a five percent chance but whatever they'll stay on the path that gives them that chance and they end up wherever they end up or does she want to be beat does she still think if she stays on this path and does run a clear second by new hampshire and then stays in a few primaries and runs second to trump but but is not denouncing him all the time that she still could be the VP. And I don't think that's totally, for all of Trump's hatred of people who betrayed him and people who've run against him, if you're really, if Trump's been grown up for a change and Nikki has gotten 30, 35% of the vote in a bunch of states, why isn't it a Reagan-Bush situation at that point? You take Nikki, you reassure all the Nikki supporters, and he's probably in, in very strong shape then. Do you think the Nikki people are thinking that? Do you think it's a fantasy, A, and do you think they're thinking it, well, do you think they're thinking it, A, and do you think it's a fantasy, B? I don't. I think that they're. I think that they're probably. I think that there's some of them that are thinking it. I think that there's some of them that are thinking. I, I. The question is, is Nikki thinking it? And it's like she's been so mercurial about Trump, right? Up and down, hot and cold. That could you say for sure that she's not thinking it? 
Anyway, okay. On that uplifting note, we're going to leave it there. This has been Ballot Box with Bill and Tim. Always, always let, ending your Tuesday night um, with the need to go have a glass of bourbon before you go to bed. Yeah, um, we can always we can always promise you that. Uh, we'll see you next Tuesday. Bill, any parting thoughts? Bourbon. Bourbon or pot, that's the question. My generation, <laughs> bourbon. But I defer to you on what the young, what the young, what the youngs will do, you know? Mm, maybe just a gummy. Maybe do a pot gummy. All right, guys. We'll see y'all later.